Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Roman Moreno, an assistant nutritionist at Seaboard Foods. So Roman, you were recently on the show. Before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself as a reminder? Yeah, uh, sure. Thank you, uh, Clayton, for having me here. Well, I um, I work for Seaboard Foods. I've been uh, doing uh, nutrition for them for the last 11 and a half years now. Uh, I got my PhD in Nebraska under Dr. Philip Miller, and um, I enjoy working with pigs. I always have, and, and I think they are a very interesting group of animals to work with. Awesome. So let's start by talking about some of the, I guess you could say, lesser known grains in swine diets, specifically milo and wheat. Um, so to start, I guess, if a producer wants to use one of these sources in his swine diets, what all do you think he needs to take into consideration? Well, wheat and milo are very interesting, and we need to always consider them a source of energy when feeding pigs. They are not as common in the United States, more common, obviously, in different areas. Uh, there are a couple of things that I think we need to always keep in mind when talking about wheat and milo. Wheat is one of the most abundant crops in the world, so it's always going to be available depending on the area. We can't pass that opportunity. And then Milo, I like Milo because Milo is a grain that saves a lot of resources. It grows, it grows in areas that corn is not going to grow, requires very little resources compared to corn. So that's always good. Uh, one of the issues with wheat and Milo, at least in the United States or in the in the areas where corn is available, is it's very sporadic. You're not going to have corn. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry wheat or milo available 100% of the time. Sometimes you have an abundance of either one of them or, or one or the other. And sometimes you don't have anything. And it depends a lot on the economics in the world. Sometimes different countries are starving for milo, so they just buy all the milo. One of the sudden, you have milo available at very low prices. So same situation with wheat. You can go for months or even years without having the option of using uh, wheat or milo. And one of the sudden you go for long, period, long, long periods of time where when you have plenty of uh, these grains to use. And always when you use them, obviously it's gonna be related to economics. You have to make sure it's a good option for your formulation. You're gonna lower your cost. And uh, we just need to keep uh, um, our, our eye open, eyes open for for grain uh, like uh, milo. And a couple of things that we need to consider is uh, grinding. Grinding is different when you're grinding milo or you're grinding wheat uh, compared to corn. Uh, one of the things that I always uh, like to mention about milo, for example, is that it's extremely easy to handle. Those round kernels or round, round BBs are gonna flow really well out of the truck, they're gonna flow really well in the feed mill. So it's extremely easy to move around. Wheat is not as easy, but it flows really well too. Um, one thing that is interesting about, about Milo is that the kernel or the little babies are uh, very irregular or not uniform in size. And what I mean is you're gonna have some really relatively big kernels and some others are very small especially if you are sourcing your milo from different areas or different farmers and these milos grow under different conditions even different varieties so that is going to create a problem where you're grinding your milo because when you change your screens to get your target particle size you may adjust your screens based on a specific size of kernel and when you have a smaller ones they are going to go through the screens intact and you're going to find those in the pellet and that's going to affect pellet quality and we'll talk about this uh, uh, a little later but in the case of wheat wheat is a little um easier to to grind to the particle size the target particle size however wheat is a little harder compared to corn and milo, so you're going to use just a little more energy, uh, and I'm talking about uh, electricity to grind, grind that wheat. So take that into consideration. If electricity is really expensive, 
you probably need to look at uh, the cost of grinding wheat uh, before going into using wheat. So moving now to pellet quality. These two grains are completely opposite when we talk about pellet quality. Milo is very difficult to pellet. It's going to produce a really poor pellet or it's going to be really difficult to pellet. One of the reasons is, like I mentioned before, you have these irregular or ununiform sizes of the kernel. And when you have one of those intact kernels that goes through the grinder and makes it to the pellet mill and is embedded in the pellet, is going to create this, it's going to make this pellet really fragile. It's going to break really easy. The other problem with this per kernels that go through the uh, grinder and through the pellet meal is when the pig eats the pellet, that kernel is going to go through the digestive system intact. That's a problem because you're losing resources there. You're spending, uh, you're not taking advantage of that kernel. It's going to go directly through the pig and you're not going to take any energy or any nutrients from that kernel. So you need to watch for that. And in the case of wheat, well, wheat is extremely easy to pellet. Even if you try to make a bad pellet, it's not going to work. The pellets are just beautiful. Um, you can have a, the best pellets. Just having 10% of wheat in the diet is going to improve your pellet quality tremendously. Uh, it's really easy. Feed meal managers really like it because it's easy to pellet. The throughput is really, it really grows. It really gets better just because you don't have to take as much time pelleting that mix because the pellet quality is really easy. So that's something that, in my opinion, is an advantage when thinking about wheat. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Um, most of the times, people is going to use combination of uh, a combination of grains. When Milo is available, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to use 100% Milo or 100% wheat. You're going to have it in combination with corn. So always keep in mind that the characteristics of the milo and the wheat are going to create some issues with pelleting if you are pelleting diets. Uh, so that's something that, uh, in my opinion, we need to keep in mind. Like you, we know feeding pigs is a challenge. At Alltech, our proven specialty ingredients work to solve your toughest challenges. Whether it's combating mycotoxins, increasing feed efficiency, or just getting a few extra pigs per litter, Alltech's full line of trace minerals, enzymes, prebiotics, and other specialty ingredients are backed by science and real customer success. Start seeing maximized health, sustainability, and profitability in your pigs, and more free time for you by visiting alltech.com slash pig today. Gotcha. So one question I have for you is specifically about the economics. How do or what exactly do you need to take in consideration when including it from an economic standpoint? Are there certain trends that need to be followed or anything like that? This is a very uh, difficult or complicated topic because it depends a lot of the current prices of the ingredient. Generally speaking, milo and corn are going to be 90% of the value of corn. And 90% is going to depend on a lot of factors. That 90% is going to be a composition or, or a, the consequence of the prices of soybean meal, corn, and your fat source. If you are using fat and fat is really expensive, that is going to bring the value of milo and wheat down because, as we know, Milo and wheat have a lower energy concentration than corn does. So if you want to formulate your diets and you, have, you want your diets to be isocaloric, you're going to have to add an extra source of concentrated energy or additional uh, energy, which is going to come in the form of oil or tallow if it's available. So just to give you kind of a, a little bit of a, guideline if you want when you have a 50 percent diet, uh, diet that is 50 percent milo and 50 percent corn if you think about the grain composition of the diet milo is going to bring the concentration of soybean meal down about 
between six and seven percent. But to keep your diets isocaloric, you are going to have to add about double the concentration of oil that you have. What I mean with this is if your current diet it has a, a 1% concentration of oil and is 100% corn, when you turn that diet into 50% corn or 50% milo, you're going to have to use 2% of oil to maintain the calorie concentration or the energy concentration of that diet. So keep that in mind. Uh, wheat is very similar. It's going to create um, the need for additional sources of fat uh, because it's, it has low lower energy than corn, and it's also going to bring the soybean meal down because it has more protein than corn. Um, and uh, those things are, are something that we need to take into consideration. Something interesting, and, and I would like to mention this briefly, when you use milo or corn, you're going to bring your concentration of soybean meal down, but the usage of synthetic amino acids is going to stay, re stay relatively unchanged. Those are not going to go up and down. If you are using, I'm just going to say something, nine pounds of dry lysine in your formula, once you add the milo or the wheat in different proportions, your concentration of lysine, the dry lysine is going to stay relatively constant. So that, that's something that uh, it makes it uh, a lot easier. Why I make emphasis on the changes in the ingredient proportion when we talk about milo and wheat in combination of corn, because when you have a, a feed meal and you one of the sudden have milo available and you bring milo to the feed meal and then suddenly you're using 50% milo and 50% corn, you need to take into consideration that the, the usage of milo, uh, I'm sorry, of tallow or oil is going to go up and that may create an issue on the feed meal because they are going to have to bring an increased, increased amount of tallow and they may or may not have the capacity to process all that tallow or that oil. So that's interesting uh, because if, if one of the sudden you do, you're using, I don't know, uh, let's say 30 tons of corn oil, and then you start using milo, and those 30 tons become 50, you may not have the capacity to use all the, to bring all that to the feed mill on a regular basis. And that creates a problem. You may have to lower the energy of the, that, your diet or to find uh, the need or to have uh, the need to, to use less grain uh, in the form of uh, milo or wheat. And um, well, finally, I would like to talk about additives. And most additives are going to work fine either with um, milo, wheat, or corn. However, for reasons that I'm not going to discuss today, because we may run out of time, and it's a very interesting topic, uh, silanases or the non starch polysaccharides are going to work better when you include them include them in diets that have wheat or milo. So keep that in mind. If you're using uh, silanases, it's a very good uh, opportunity to, to improve your digestibility and even lower mortality a little bit when you use uh, grain like milo or wheat. Um, with this, uh, my last uh, recommendation is watch, uh, always watch your um, amino acid ratios especially the branch chain amino acids. Those proportions have to be uh, maintained and especially watch the leucine. If you go over uh, 150%, you have to make adjustment, adjustments in the other uh, branch chain amino acids. So uh, that's my last recommendation. Obviously, these are general ideas. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to give you kind of a, a, a broad uh, picture of what is to use wheat and milo. And my advice would be not to be afraid of using them. They are a very good uh, ingredient. We just need to make sure we use them properly and it will help your operation to save money and, and uh, in another different aspect. So 
with this, I don't know if, if you guys have any questions or anything uh, I'm missing and we would like to discuss. Yeah, I do have one question for you. Um, but with mycotoxins with um, Milo or wheat, do you see anything different or does it typically just kind of follow the same general trend as the corn will around here? Very, very good question. Interesting for sure. Uh, mycotoxins, uh, obviously, we are always concerned about them. And in my experience, the mycotoxins that we're going to find, at least in in, um, in the corn belt area in uh, where there's a lot of corn, they are going to follow, uh, milo and, and wheat are going to follow corn. So if you have mycotoxins in corn, most likely you're going to have uh, mycotoxins in milo and in wheat. Gotcha. Well, I believe it's all the time we have. So thank you again for coming on the show and sharing all this experience with us. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com. <laughs> <laughs>